Hello, you're watching Eastern Europe Review, a program dedicated to the situation in Belarus, Ukraine and Russia. This is a joint production of Belsat TV and TVP World. My name is Mitsur Mitskevich and let's take a look at the headlines. Armenia seeks greater independence from Russia, while Kremlin sees Western plot behind these desires. The announcement made by the Armenian side comes amidst a series of unfriendly steps and statements by officials in Yerevan. Unfulfilled promises. How Putin led Russians to wealth. By 2030, the minimum wage should almost double to 35,000 rubles. False celebration. Two dictators mark the so-called Day of Unity of the peoples of Russia and Belarus. Lukashenko and his associates are making very good money from the war. But if the war ends with a victory for Ukraine, this will all collapse. Under an agreement between Russia and Armenia, the Kremlin's security services have been protecting the Armenian border and controlling customs for more than 30 years. However, nothing lasts forever. Recently, the Armenian government has decided that the Russian bodyguards must leave Yerevan Zvartnots airport starting from August the 1st of this year. Russian border guards, who are part of the Federal Security Service, have been officially operating at Armenian borders and security checkpoints since 1992. According to a bilateral agreement, four border guard units patrol the borders with Azerbaijan, Iran and Turkey. And one special unit is responsible for passport and customs control at Zvartnot airport. Following Yerevan's decision, as of August the 1st, FSB officers serving at the airport must vacate their positions. Their remaining officers are to remain for the time being. Customs officers are to be replaced by their Armenian counterparts. We have informed the Russian side that we have made such a decision. In the letter, the deadline is August the 1st, 2024. This is a procedural matter not a political or geopolitical one. The letter expresses gratitude to the Russian side and is primarily a letter of appreciation. In addition, we have given notice that as of August the 1st, we will be independently managing services at the airport. The issue of Russian border guards was among the first to be raised at the big annual press conference of Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. Alan Simonyan, speaker of the country's parliament, followed up with a statement claiming that all formalities had allegedly been arranged with the Russian side. However, Moscow responded by reminding Yerevan of several contentious issues. Its close contacts with France, the presence of the EU observation mission on Armenia's borders, Armenia's unwillingness to sign a peace treaty with Azerbaijan in Moscow, and its suspension of participation in some events of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO, of six post-Soviet states. We would like to note that the announcement made by the Armenian side comes amidst a series of unfriendly steps and statements by officials in Yerevan. Such an initiative appears to be inconsistent with the security interests of Armenia and its citizens, especially considering the long-standing cooperation between Russian and Armenian border guards. At the same time, the legal basis for the rotation of border guards has not been clearly defined. For Moscow, this is seen as a pretext to prevent FSB officers from leaving the Zvartnots airport and a reason to accuse an ally of unfriendly behavior. Russian state propaganda openly discusses Armenia's betrayal and the potential for retaliation. There is much to fear. The city of Gyumri, 100 kilometers north of Armenia's capital city Yerevan, is where the 102nd base of the Russian army is located. This is a fully-fledged unit, with heavy weapons and a contingent of almost 5,000 people, including a peacekeeping corps. However, for Armenia, the reassignment of border guards in Svartnots holds significant importance amidst the expansion of air communication with Europe. Schengen's own countries and European countries are planning to ease their visa regime. 
And Armenia is already fully prepared for this. In this regard, it is unacceptable for the visa regime with European countries to be eased for Armenian citizens while they are subjected to database checks by Russian border guards. Now the Russian FSB indeed has access to the database of the Armenian Border Guard Service, which contains all information on arrivals and departures. This constitutes a direct violation of the country's law. The majority of Armenian society has remarkably approved the decision to replace the border services. This is Vart Nots. We have European politicians coming and going. It's not necessary for Russia to know who comes and where they're going. It's the right thing to do. Armenia is a separate state and a separate country. Why Russia? Are our border guards responsible for protecting their airport? No. Armenia, a former Soviet Union country, remains closely tied economically to Russia, even 30 years after the collapse of the USSR. Changing the balance of these relations on a global scale would prove to be very difficult. After the so-called Russian presidential elections, Vladimir Putin began to make grand promises. The Russian president announced that the minimum wage in Russia will rise from 200 US dollars this year to 350 in six years. This is not the first time Putin has made such promises, and he has a history of not keeping them. This month, just a few weeks after the so-called Russian presidential elections, Putin, according to his tradition, has made some far-reaching promises. E. This time round, the president started talking about increasing the minimum wage from $200 to $370. By 2030, the minimum wage should almost double to 35,000 rubles. Recently, Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin has stated that the number of poor people in the Russian Federation is 13.5 million, which accounts for 9.3% of the country's population. Currently in Russia, a person is considered poor if they earn less than $150 a month, which falls below the subsistence minimum. Individuals earning, for instance, $170 are no longer classified as poor. Good economy, a government gives uh, enough money to, to build uh, roads, to build infrastructure. Uh, we feel no problems. In 2023, nearly 200,000 teachers left Russian schools. Independent journalists have calculated that this figure was the highest in seven years. Additionally, in 75 regions of Russia, teacher salaries are below the minimum wage, which is less than $200 per month. Putin has been in power for a quarter of a century now. Naturally, the question arises, if, in the absence of war and sanctions, in a situation where foreign countries were happy to buy our oil and gas, the head of state was unable to do anything of what he is talking about now, then what grounds do citizens have to assume that now, all of a sudden, he'll be able to deal with it? The fact is, many promises have been made during Putin's reign. For example, the promise to catch up with and overtake Portugal. This pledge was made at the very end of 1999, when the young Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin issued his manifesto, where he outlined his vision for the future of the country, which was about to come under his leadership. In order to achieve GDP production per capita at the level of modern Portugal or Spain, we will need approximately 15 years with a GDP growth rate of at least 8% per year. If we manage to maintain a GDP growth rate of 10% per year over the same 15 years, we will reach the current level of GDP production per capita of Great Britain or France. After Putin's four presidential terms, reaching Portugal's level remains elusive. According to the World Bank, in 2022, Russia's GDP per capita was approximately $15,000, whereas Portugal's was $24,500. At the onset of his second term, the head of state declared an active campaign against dilapidated social housing. Consequently, the battle against slums and poverty has been a recurring theme in Putin's speeches for almost a quarter of a century. 
Надо довести до конца модернизацию жилищно-коммунального хозяйства. Мы с вами должны вытащить людей из трущоб. Нужно избавиться от бараков и аварийного жилья. Решить вопрос по аварийному жилью. However, in March this year, an extraordinary incident took place in the Saratov region. A resident of an old social housing apartment building in the city of Engels fell into the basement, flooded with sewage, along with her bathtub and toilet. According to the woman's neighbors, residents of the building had repeatedly complained about its condition, but the authorities refused to recognize it as unsafe. It was only after the bathroom, along with the apartment owner and her friend, collapsed into the basement that the mayor's office admitted that the apartment was uninhabitable. However, the rest of the building did not receive emergency status. Needless to say, the authorities are responsible for renovating social housing buildings. Putin and Lukashenko exchanged congratulations on the so-called Day of Unity of the peoples of Russia and Belarus. Putin emphasized that much had been done to strengthen the common institutions, while Lukashenko announced new prospects for cooperation. However, for Belarusians themselves, April the 2nd is hardly a holiday, despite the special celebrations organized by the authorities in Belarusian cities. The so-called Day of Unity of the peoples of Russia and Belarus is taken seriously by the Lukashenko authorities. Festive concerts as well as rallies, telecasts and parades are being organized in the country on April the 2nd by the administrative resource body. Special lessons are held in schools and congratulations are sent to all levels, from heads of state to representatives of youth organizations. This holiday is a very significant event that unites the people of the Republic of Belarus and Russia into one big family. The issue of economic integration with Russia was first raised in Belarus during the 1995 referendum. The official beginning of the unity was inaugurated on April 2, 1996, when Lukashenko and Boris Yeltsin signed an agreement on the association of Belarus and Russia. As a sign of protest, people took to the streets of Minsk for a mass march, during which participants were detained and beaten by the security forces. A year later, the same two presidents signed an agreement on the creation of a union between Belarus and Russia. This relationship cannot and could never be called equal. If one country subsidizes another for decades, and at some point this reaches 15% of the GDP of the state being subsidized, then consequences must definitely be expected. Mass protests following the 2020 presidential elections in Belarus, along with a harsh response from the Lukashenko regime, led to increased confrontation with the West. The forced landing of the Ryanair plane in May 2021 and the migration crisis provoked by the regime further exacerbated the situation. Lukashenko subsequently became even more dependent on Russia, and with the onset of a full-scale war against Ukraine, the Belarusian economy has almost completely aligned itself with the Russian one. We need to cooperate with our own people not with the French and Germans. According to the National Committee of Statistics, 52 new companies with Russian capital entered Belarus last year, and the proportion of Russian investments in the economy constituted two-thirds of all foreign funds. This represents a 10 percentage point increase compared to year 2022. Lukashenko and his associates are making very good money from the war. But if the war ends with a victory for Ukraine, this will all collapse. All these machines, all production will not just be reduced by 5%, but will stop completely. By 2020, Lukashenko had the opportunity to reduce Belarus's dependence on Russia by establishing contacts with the West. However, under current circumstances, there is little room for maneuver, although periodically Lukashenko seems to hint at a dialogue with the West. These hints boil down to the idea that the dialogue will be conducted on his terms, but the West won't agree to this today, and any serious conversation will begin with the demand to release political prisoners.
It will end there, because Lukashenko isn't ready for that. Meanwhile, the ideology of the Russian world is actively taking root in Belarus. Recently, the Russian Center of Science and Culture, the so-called Russian House, has been opened in Horadnya, which is the fourth in Belarus, by endorsing these institutions. Belarus facilitated trips of Belarusian children to occupied Crimea and collected humanitarian aid for the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. That's all for today. Eastern Europe Review will be back next Sunday. Please stay with TVP World and stand with Ukraine.